All right, Chapter 11, Plant Health Care, often referred to as PHC. It's a modern, holistic approach to tree and landscape care that focuses on long-term health and proactive management, instead of just reacting to problems after they arise. In the past, we relied heavily on broad-spectrum pesticides and quick-release fertilizers. The goal is to control pests and push fast growth. But over time, we realized this approach often created more problems than it solved. Today, the focus has shifted. PHC aims to manage pests at tolerable levels and keep plants healthy through better planning, site care, and prevention. Most tree issues aren't caused by one single factor. They result from a combination of stresses. That's why PHC takes a broader view. Plant health care looks at the entire landscape, the living and non-living elements. It considers how pests interact with each other and with their environment. This holistic approach recognizes that treating one issue in isolation often misses the bigger picture. Instead, we work to improve the whole system. PHC is all about being proactive. Instead of waiting for visible signs of decline, we try to prevent problems before they start. That means good plant selection, improving soil conditions, and ongoing monitoring. By catching issues early, we can avoid the need for excessive treatment later on. Trees don't grow in a vacuum. They compete with turf, shrubs, and other plants for light, water, and nutrients. Even routine maintenance for one plant can affect another. For example, fertilizing turf too much might encourage pests in nearby trees. Understanding these interactions is a key to effective PHC. Take a golf course, for example. Trees and turf share the same space, but they often have conflicting needs. Turf irrigation can lead to root rot in trees. Too much nitrogen can boost pests. Mowers can damage trunks and roots. So it's critical for arborists and turf managers to collaborate on maintenance practices that support the whole landscape. In residential areas, it's common for homeowners to hire separate services for trees, lawns, and landscaping. But when these companies don't communicate, it leads to overlap, especially with fertilization. That can increase pest pressure, harm the environment, and waste money. PHC promotes a coordinated, efficient approach that benefits both plants and people. And one of the biggest challenges in PHC is that arborists are often called in when it's too late, after the damage is already done. Ideally, we'd be involved in the design stage, choosing the right plants for the site, and setting them up for success. When trees are planted properly and cared for early on, they need less maintenance down the road. So what is it that makes a plant healthy? A healthy plant has good structure, and it looks good, and it can handle stress. We often hear the terms vigor and vitality. Vigor is the plant's genetic potential to tolerate stress. Vitality is how well it's performing in its current environment. Most of what we do in PHC is aimed at supporting vitality because we usually come in after the plant is in place. Trees use sugars they produce through photosynthesis to power five main functions. Maintenance, growth, storage, reproduction, and defense. How they distribute energy between these functions depends on their age, health, environment, and stress levels. Understanding this helps us tailor care practices to what the plant really needs. Stress happens when a plant can't access enough light, water, nutrients, or carbon dioxide. Or when it has too much of any of those. Stress can come from soil compaction, drought, flooding, or construction damage. When trees are stressed, they often shift resources from growth and defense to survival. That's when we start seeing decline. Trees have natural defense systems. They can use physical barriers like thorns and thick cuticles or chemical defenses like tannins or other compounds. Some of these chemicals like neem and pyrethrin are even used in organic pesticides. Still, some, uh, some pests can overcome these defenses, especially if the tree is under stress. Mild stress can sometimes improve resistance by boosting defensive chemical production. But too much nitrogen, especially if from fertilizers, can reduce resistance and encourage pests. That's because fast-growing succulent tissue is often more nutritious and attractive to insects. Trees are adaptable. They adjust leaf size, root growth, and even their energy allocation to deal with stress. 
Low water, they grow more roots. Not enough light, they stretch their shoots. Low nitrogen, they grow thicker leaves. But too much or repeated stress can cause decline. And once the spiral starts, recovery becomes much harder. At the heart of PHC is monitoring. We observe, record, and analyze what's happening in the landscape. The goal is early detection and appropriate response. We gather information, assess severity, weigh options, and communicate clearly with the client. This is called the Appropriate Response Process, or ARP. In PHC, we borrow the idea of thresholds from pest management. In agriculture, a pest is treated when it threatens the crop's value. In landscapes, the threshold is often more aesthetic. Sometimes a pest isn't harming the plant's health, but it bothers the client. Part of our job is knowing when to act and when to hold off. Education is a major part of PHC. Arborists need to know what they're doing and explain it clearly. Sometimes the best course of action is to do nothing and just help the client understand why. PHC is a philosophy. It's about long-term thinking, clear communication, and making the best decision for the whole landscape. Pest management is an essential part of plant health care. After World War II, pest control was dominated by the use of synthetic pesticides. This approach continued for decades but raised growing concerns about its impact on the environment, beneficial organisms, and even human health. In response, IPM was developed as a more su a suitable and effective solution. So what exactly is IPM? Integrated pest management is a method that combines various control tactics into one well-rounded strategy. It considers the ecological, social, and economic impacts of pest control. The goal is to manage pests in a way that maintains healthy, structurally sound, and aesthetically pleasing landscapes without over-relying on chemicals. IPM isn't a standalone method. It fits within the larger framework of plant health care. PHC is a holistic approach to managing plant health through soil care, pruning, fertilization, irrigation, and pest management. IPM supports all of these by focusing on long-term solutions that prevent problems before they start. And it's important to remember that most organisms in the landscape aren't even pests. In fact, many are beneficial. Bees pollinate, ladybugs control aphids, and fungi and bacteria break down organic matter. One of the goals of IPM is to protect these helpful organisms while managing the ones that are truly harmful. What is a pest? In a managed landscape, a pest is any organism that interferes with plant health or human use of the space. That might mean an insect feeding on tree leaves, a weed outcompeting desirable plants, or a fungus damaging turf. But not every pest needs to be controlled. Context matters. What's considered a pest in one setting may not be in another. So IPM doesn't encourage treating every pest you see. Instead, it emphasizes monitoring. We assess the pest population, determine whether it's causing real damage, and only intervene if action thresholds are crossed. This avoids unnecessary treatment and helps preserve the balance of the ecosystem. The main goal of IPM is not pest eradication, it's pest management. We aim to keep pest populations at levels where they don't cause unacceptable harm. Eradication is rarely necessary and often not achievable. Exceptions include highly infectious diseases or invasive species that pose major risks to the landscape. An effective IPM strategy involves regular monitoring and action thresholds to guide decision making. It works alongside other PHC practices to promote plant vigor. It avoids harming beneficial organisms, keeps environmental disruption to a minimum, and always takes cost effective and client goals into account. Monitoring is the backbone of any effective IPM program. We conduct regular inspections to gather three types of information. First, we observe the site itself, looking at conditions like shade, water flow, or construction. Next, we examine the plants, checking for signs of stress or decline. Finally, we collect data on pests or disorders we observe. This layered approach helps us make informed, timely decisions. Understanding site conditions gives us critical context. 
we look at recent weather, drainage patterns, nearby construction, and changes to surrounding plants. These factors can directly affect pest presence and plant health. Site history is often key to diagnosing recurring or long-developing problems. Plant health influences both susceptibility and tolerance to plants. We examine traits like leaf size and color, new twig growth, and any visible symptoms. Phenological clues such as timing of leaf drop or flowering also help us understand what's normal and what's not. Recognizing deviations early is vital to successful management. Diseases are often harder to catch early, so we stay alert for both symptoms and signs. Symptoms might include wilting, necrosis, or chlorosis. Signs include visible fungal structures or bacterial ooze. It helps to know which species are disease-prone and to review the site's disease history. When pests are present, we identify the species and life stage. We assess how many are present and whether natural predators are help keeping them in check. Correct timing is everything. Some pests are only vulnerable during certain life stages. The more accurate our monitoring, the better our treatment outcomes. We use a variety of tools to inspect and diagnose issues. Hand lenses, soil probes, and field guides are staples. Sample containers help us collect material for lab analysis when needed. Traps are used for pests that hide or are active at night. Each tool helps us refine our decisions. We use phenology to match pest activity with observable plant events like bloom or leaf out. Degree day models help us predict pest development stages using temperature data. This allows us to time treatments more precisely, improving effectiveness and reducing waste. Key stressors are those pests or side issues that predictably cause serious problems. Key plants are either highly valuable or especially susceptible to those stressors. By identifying these, we can prioritize our monitoring and management efforts where they'll have the greatest impact. The primary goal in most cases is prevention, using cultural practices to avoid pest outbreaks. Suppression is the most common practical goal, keeping pest populations below damaging levels. Eradication is rare and only pursued when dealing with exotic or highly destructive pests. We support plant health to naturally resist pests. That includes reducing stress through proper care and sanitation, like removing infected debris. Timing also matters, whether it's pruning, fertilization, or irrigating. Done properly, these practices help plants outcompete pests. Cultural controls involve thoughtful choices like planting the right species, maintaining healthy soil, and mulching properly. Mechanical controls include hand-picking pests or using barriers to keep them off of plants. These approaches reduce habitat for pests and increase plant resilience. And as we've talked about a few times, putting the right plant in the right place is a powerful preventive strategy. Choose species that are pest resistant and suited to site conditions. Avoid monocultures. Diverse plantings help support natural pest control and reduce risk. There are many hands-on ways to manage pests, removing bagworms by hand, pruning infective limbs to stop ca uh, cankers from spreading, or installing trunk guards to block boars or rodents. These are all effective mechanical strategies. They're low cost and will fit well into any IPM framework. Biological control is the use of natural enemies to suppress pest populations. These include predators, parasites, and pathogens. Many native pests already have these natural enemies, and in many cases, they keep pest numbers low enough that no further intervention is needed. In urban landscapes, natural biological control may not always be enough. When pest populations exceed tolerable levels, applied biological control may be a viable alternative, especially where pesticides are undesirable, like near playgrounds, patios, or water features. There are three types of biological control. Introduction of non-native enemies for exotic pests. Conservation of existing natural enemies through habitat support and limiting pesticide use. And then we have augmentation, which involves releasing beneficials like ladybugs or parasitoid wasps into the landscape. 
Examples of beneficial organisms include lady beetles, lacewings, predatory mites, and parasitoid wasps. The downside is biological control tends to be slower and less predictable than chemical control. While pesticides, while pesticides may work in hours, biological methods often take days or weeks. Still, they offer long-term, environmentally friendly pest suppression. Chemical control uses pesticides such as insecticides, miticides, fungicides, and herbicides. It's appropriate when biological or cultural controls aren't effective or practical. However, regulations must always be followed and applicators need to be properly trained and licensed. And pesticides are either contact, which means they kill pests on contact, or systemic, which are absorbed into plant tissue. Systemic products can treat pests like boars and leaf miners but take longer to work. Contact pesticides act faster but require thorough coverage and good timing. Each type has its place. Contact products may be less effective in dense vegetation or under rainy conditions. Systemic applications by injection may minimize above-ground exposure but could risk groundwater contamination or plant injury, especially in drought-stressed trees. For any pesticide use, you must identify the pest correctly, evaluate how serious the issue is, choose a product that targets the pest, apply the right dose at the right time using the correct technique, and you want to always follow the label and legal requirements. The label is the law. The risks of misusing pesticides include harm to non-target organisms, resistance development, secondary pest outbreaks, and even legal consequences. Overusing broad-spectrum pesticides can lead to resistance, which is where pests survive treatments and pass on resistant tree genes. Resurgence is where pests bounce back once natural enemies are gone. And secondary outbreaks, where new pests will fill the vacuum left behind. That's why precise, limited applications are best. Many modern and bioirrational products are effective pest suppression with fewer environmental risks. These include insecticidal soaps, horticulture oils, botanicals, and microbial agents. Though milder, they are still require proper handling. Soaps break down soft-bodied pest membranes. They're effective but have no residual effects. Oils work by smothering pests and come in two types dormant and summer oils. Timing and temperature are crucial to avoid plant damage. Botanical pesticides come from plants, like neem or pyrethrin. They vary from mild to highly toxic. Microbial products include bacteria like Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt. Different strains target different pests, like beetles, caterpillars, or even mosquito larvae. They're effective and very safe for non-target organisms. And lastly, insect growth regulators disrupt pest development or reproduction, and some even lure pests into traps because they mimic insect hormones. Well, that's the end of Chapter 11. Thanks for following along. Get ready for Chapter 12. Please hit the like and subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.